Get a Book Dot today presents Strike Battleship Argent, Book One in the Starships at War series by Shane Lachlan Black, copyright 2016. Stand by for action. Want new bonus chapters? Of course! Everyone wants bonus chapters! If you like what you see in here, give us a super thanks. Buttons are below every video. Every super thanks goes directly to new science fiction. Don't miss our action premieres where you can enjoy the story live. Want to rank up and get special recognition? Become a channel member. You might even become an honorary Skywatch Marine. Join us, subscribe, hit the notification bell, like and comment, and don't forget to visit the bookstore where you will find my latest books and one-of-a-kind officially licensed gear. All ahead, battle speed! Chapter 56 DSS Dunkirk was literally running for her life. Somehow, Commander DeMay had managed to escape from the formation and maneuver the heavy vessel through a diving hyperbolic course that cleared the oncoming attack formation and only drew two pursuers. One moment he was going over checklists. The next he was in a running gun battle and redlining his engines. On the one hand, he was furiously angry he wasn't able to pull more heat away from the fleet. On the other hand, he was more than a little relieved he wasn't going to have to run to a spot and then fight his way home. The enemy ships were both fast destroyers armed with enough firepower to cause major problems for the undermanned ship if they got in range. Dunkirk easily outgunned them in a stand-up fight, but that was unfortunately the one thing she wasn't capable of at the moment. Set a course for Barker's asteroid. All ahead flank. Continuous acceleration. Sir, that will put us in range of the minefield in less than four minutes the pilot shouted. Then let's hope Hunter was right about this ship's transponders. We've got to get that Sentinel into operation as planned. Battle comp reports enemy contacts are closing. Range now 10,000 miles, Lieutenant Austin shouted. He was one of DeMay's hand-picked officers, chosen for his considerable experience as third watch officer of the deck aboard Argent. Weapons, weapons, there's got to be a way, DeMay half growled, half shouted as he steadily pounded his fist on the arm of the command chair. We don't have the personnel, sir. We're doing well to man the helm and engines at this point with only two dozen people, Austin shouted. Toby suddenly rose from the command chair. But we do have the weapons themselves, right? We can arm them manually, can't we? Affirmative, Skipper, but I'm not sure. DeMay punched up the intraship. Engineering, get me three tactical-trained able crewmen in the center magazine with tack suits and environmental harnesses on the double. Bridge out. What's your plan, Captain? Eh. We're going to roll our anti-ship missiles out the back door like depth charges, Lieutenant. If we set them for delayed detonation, they'll act like proximity charges. And if we equip them with magnetic field activators, the enemy ship hulls will draw them in like seagulls to a burger joint. Pilot, give me a range and ETA to the edge of the minefield. Two minutes, 20 seconds, present speed. Full power to aft battle screens. Austin, you have the con. Let's hope that transponder theory doesn't turn out to be a wrong guess. Commander DeMay ran for the magazine deck. Chapter 57. What are you? The being that towered grotesquely in the cross corridor fixed a chilling gaze on Colonel Moody. It had already absorbed four maximum power shots from his blaster and was unaffected. It looked vaguely human if every feature of a normal person was stretched vertically to twice its normal height. It wore featureless black. Its mouth opened, and a chorus of screeching voices filled the air. Irisless white eyes stared at nothing. Its unusually large skull was hairless and covered in bruise-like veins. Moody fired again and again, but the creature simply turned and floated back up the corridor, ignoring the powerful energy bolts it absorbed without reacting. Shadowy humanoids streamed around it and rushed towards Moody. He cut several down with his blaster pistol before he engaged the rest hand to hand. The big marine officer was more than a match for the relatively weak intruders one on one, and in the narrow cross corridor they were only able to get at him one or two at a time. He clocked the first one with his blaster, ramming into its helmet straight on. The second swung wide and was rewarded with a swiftly broken elbow. After they slumped to the floor, the ones behind stumbled forward. The colonel was having the best of it until one grabbed him from behind. It jabbed a knife-like device into his neck. There was a moment of disorientation and then... 
All Mu could say for sure was he was standing on a precipice that seemed hundreds of miles away from what it overlooked. Before him was a gigantic, dull green, translucent spherical object suspended inside an even larger chamber. If he didn't know better, he would have said he was looking down on a planet during re-entry. The sight caused a wave of vertigo to rush over the colonel. The distances he perceived were beyond human comprehension. He had never been inside a structure even a tiny fraction as large as this one. It was cold and damp, and not home to anything even vaguely resembling human beings. Yet somehow, Moody could feel a presence at the center of that sphere. Somehow, he knew it was Admiral Hughes. An image formed in his mind. He could see a human face staring into infinity, mouth wide open and thoughts of slaughter and conquest seeping from its mind. A thousand chittering sounds stormed into Moody's consciousness, and over them a voice that was becoming less human by the moment. Weakness must be consumed, the strong must aspire to greater things, else all is lost. They weren't audible sounds in the strictly human sense. The words felt like an icy cold wind drifting through the colonel's soul. The sounds conjured images of graveyards and decay. Magnificent, isn't it? What is born from here will soon be warlord of your reality. Colonel Atwell approached Lucas's vantage point. He still wore the same faded and damaged uniform. You weren't making any sense before and you aren't making any now, Colonel, Mu replied, still dizzy from the effects of the transition to Ithis space. Nonsense. We have been taught our entire lives how sacred life is, yet we never even once consider the sheer power of anti-life. When I get you back home, I'm going to celebrate your court-martial with a nice thick steak, Atwell. You're a traitor to your own race, and you're a traitor to Skywatch. Skywatch is a bacterial colony, Colonel. I'm talking about galactic civilizations here. You don't even recognize what you are seeing. This structure alone is so far beyond the pathetic boundaries of human engineering there are perhaps five men alive who could even understand it. If you flew across that expanse at your ship's best speed, it would take days to reach the other side. Only three men have ever seen an enclosed space this large in all human history. The Ithis are the stronger species. Why can't you accept that? If they're so strong, then why do they need a fleet of our ships to do their dirty work? Why steal our technology and attack our people? What could they possibly have to gain? They want what is in our minds. The more primal and more powerful our emotions, the stronger it makes them. They see us as a source of primitive vitality. It is something they've lost over the millennia, but they never lost their craving for it. If they're that advanced, they can find their cavemen elsewhere, Mu replied. Why did you bring me here? To see and experience what Admiral Hughes has become and to consider your own destiny. You will witness the sheer power at his command, and you will join us in our great mission to reinvigorate a thousand ancient civilizations with humanity's one unique spark, Colonel. The resulting conquest will be so far beyond anything we've dared dream of, I suspect none will command the words to describe it. There's nothing here for you, Atwell. You've gone mad and sacrificed Admiral Hughes to whatever is taking place in there. Moody glanced at the distant structure and again was almost staggered by the sheer volume of visual information he was asking his mind to process. He closed his eyes and tried to regain his composure. End this. Turn my back on the greatest discovery in human history, and you're the one accusing me of madness? Even if we leave aside the fact we could be witnessing what no other human being ever will, what of the technologies these creatures have gathered? They have been traveling space in their dimension for millions of years. They only seek to rule us like they rule every other species they conquer. The Raleo obelisk is only a tiny demonstration of how they can change our entire reality. Which means only one thing, Atwell. We have about as much business here as roaches have asking me about fuel cell maintenance. We don't belong here. Now send me back to my ship, or I'll make it clear to the Admiral and anyone else in this circus you aren't to be trusted. You turned your back on your own species. The more advanced these of this are, the more likely it is they'll recognize your treachery for what it is. Oh, they already understand it, Colonel. They just don't care. You can bark at them if you wish. If they don't kill you outright, they'll simply empty your mind and consume what is left of you for heat. It's not a pleasant process. If you like, I will introduce you to the humans it's been performed on. Have you ever seen a man or woman with literally no mind? Then what are you waiting for, Colonel? Moo growled, his muscles trembling with a barely restrained rage. 
Once the two human fleets have destroyed each other, the core will be unprotected, and our rulers can enter our existence to take what is theirs. Hughes is simply giving the Ithis the savage impulse to invade and conquer, and when the Admiral's mind is gone, yours will take its place. Atwell turned to leave. The Overmind will turn man's flawed nature into his extinction, and we're going to start with Captain Jason Hunter. Chapter 58 Not far away from where Moo was abducted, Lieutenant Tixia was holed up in an alcove with one of the intruder's communications devices. In her lap was a fully armed blaster. She was hard at work trying to figure out how the device functioned so she could listen in on the enemy's communications, but the mechanism and circuitry were totally unfamiliar to her. The strangely shaped device seemed to be designed to wear on the side of the head near the ear and also seemed to have some oddly biological components of some kind. In fact, it had changed shape at least once since she retrieved it from the intruder she had shot. She was certain it had something to do with their ability to teleport as well, but that was a secondary concern. Right now, she just wanted to listen in. A row of yellow lights lit up one side of the device, which didn't tell the young signals officer much. She was just about to give up when a chorus of dissonant sounds came from it. They sounded like screams of pain and only lasted a few moments. Then it was silent again. She turned the device over and continued trying to get it to work. All at once the ship's power shut off completely. The entire deck was plunged into darkness. Even her blaster pistol indicators went dark. Sparks and flashes from the damaged electrical junctions continued for a few moments and then even they were gone. As she experienced the loss of artificial gravity and felt herself float up off the floor, Zoni heard something. It was coming from the device she had commandeered. It sounded like the radio transmission of a creature of some kind breathing. It grew louder as she listened. Finally, there was a voice. It made the hairs on the back of her neck stand straight up. You were all warned, Lieutenant. Chapter 59 Echo's spinning light bars illuminated the dim service corridor with flashes of red. She had found her way to Deck 3 and was using the starboard electrical service corridor to bypass most of the damage below. Her little headlights gave her enough visibility to avoid the largest pieces of debris, but she still kept her speed low as she picked her way towards the forward section of the ship. Occasional explosions and rumbling could be heard in the distance. The ship was ostensibly at general quarters, but intraship communications were out and all of the fleet's voice channels were being jammed. Artificial gravity was failing intermittently, but the activated electromagnetic plates built into her chassis kept her firmly on the floor. They would continue to do so as long as she stayed on metal surfaces. The damage she had suffered in the Station 19 battle was problematic, but not serious enough to affect her combat worthiness. She was still 88% functional. Echo had the ability to pierce the local interference well enough to establish contact with Fury's crew, but the advanced programming Jace had installed for her higher functions argued otherwise. Giving away her position could be catastrophic. Even though she was a medical unit, she still understood battle protocols and she knew well the possible price of not maintaining radio silence. What Echo's core programming insisted on was far more important. Go to AC. From the time she was nothing but a circuit board and a battery on a wheeled chassis, Echo had learned that if anything went wrong, she was to go back to wherever AC was. That was her top priority no matter what. Years ago, it meant when she got lost in a maze, or got caught in a rainstorm, or got one of her wheels damaged, she should return to her builder's lab for repairs. Now, go to AC meant she needed to locate her commander, because the fleet needed her, and if AC was hurt, Echo might be the difference between the fleet having a commander and not having one. The little ambulance was always the one that came home. Commander Hunter had spent hours and sometimes days tracking down her other units. Given their relative weight, flight, and amphibious capabilities, that sometimes put them places where it wasn't as easy to retrieve them as a young cybernetic specialist would have liked. Rebel always seemed to end up disabled in a hole or canyon somewhere. Lunar often ended up without power hundreds of feet above the deck. Then there was the weekend butterfly got confused during a hide-and-seek game and went dark. It took four bots and one commander the better part of two days to find and catch her. But every time one of them got hung up somewhere or got confused or lost, Echo was always the one to come home. Sometimes it took minutes. Other times it might take days, but she would always find a way, 
and she would always lead AC back to the other minibots. Echo had made several attempts to locate the rest of her minibot team, but so far had been unsuccessful. Having Butterfly around would certainly make it easier for a wheeled vehicle to get past the broken machinery, conduits, and junk in the access corridor. Even having Rebel here would help, as he would just push it all out of the way for her. But so far, the only thing Echo had established for certain was that whatever jammed the fleet communications was also preventing the minibots from reaching each other, and that meant Echo was on her own. She certainly wasn't helpless, however. The little ambulance was transmitting a multi-frequency ultra-wideband ECM screen that made her all but impossible to locate with any known tracking technology. She was fleet frequency silent but monitoring nearly 20,000 channels for any sign of a friendly unit. She also had both of her high-energy subsonic emitters fully charged. A burst from either one could knock a full-grown human being unconscious at ranges of up to 15 yards. Sustained signals from either one could incapacitate an entire room full of people. Her old-style fire truck banger siren was also more than capable of scaring the hell out of her opponents, human or animal, if necessary. But all of that aside, Echo had a mission. Go to AC. Chapter 60 The only reason Zoni Tixia wasn't scared out of her mind was the light still emanating from the alien transmitter she had found. When all the other power aboard Argent went dark, the only source of light in the crew quarters corridor was the little row of yellow indicators along the edge of the odd mechanism. Even her blaster pistol had lost its charge, but for whatever reason the transmitter wasn't affected. It was then she noticed something unusual. After the strange voice told her, You were warned, Lieutenant, several new indicator lights appeared at what the signals officer now believed was the base of the device. There were a total of eight lights. Four of them were lit up with colors ranging from a light green to a dark orange. Then they shifted, moving the colors around to other lights. Zoni watched the indicators shift for a minute or so, looking for any familiar sign the device might have enough of a connection to human technology for her to make some use of its capabilities. Then it hit her. It wasn't mechanically activated, it was bioelectric, and the circuitry was activated by sound. It was the only thing that made sense. She turned the device over and over. There was something odd about the small panel lights, too. The patterns looked familiar for some reason. By now, Zoni was seven feet off the floor and wedged into the relatively small alcove above the spot she had chosen for a hiding place. Without light or power, there was no chance she would be able to find her way to safety. The fact the emergency auto systems hadn't engaged yet was alarming enough without dwelling on the no-power problem. She decided to test her theory. After twisting herself around to make sure the alien device didn't float away, she let go of it and let it drift. The yellow lights and indicators went out. She was suspended in total blackness. Here goes nothing, she said quietly. She put her hands back on the object and the yellow lights brightened back to their original intensity. The tiny indicators at the base of the object began to blink again, repeating the same pattern from when they first appeared. Bioelectric, she exhaled. Hmm. She continued turning the device over, looking for more indicators. Finding none, she returned her attention to what she could see. By now, she had two theories. One was the yellow indicators were there to signal a complete charge. They were on the head side of the device in order to make use of the wearer's peripheral vision without being unduly distracting. If, for whatever reason, the device's power level dropped, the light would either dim or go out, which would be visible to the wearer without obstructing their view. The second theory was a little more fuzzy, but the longer she studied the visible patterns in the smaller indicator lights, the stronger it got. Alpha, Beta, Charlie, Delta, Echo, Foxtrot. Zoni watched the indicators change their patterns as she spoke. Eventually, different colors appeared and the entire sequence had been altered. Zulu, Yankee, X-Ray, Whiskey, Victor, Uniform. Again, she watched and saw almost exactly what she expected to see. The indicator lights were changing their patterns based on her voice print. They were visual indications of the sound patterns they had recorded. She surmised that's why they lit up when the enemy broadcast was received. But there was one thing out of place. Every recorded pattern had an identical pattern attached to it. Zoni concluded after a short time those were identifying flags there to signify a different voice. Using that as her theory, she began walking the device through all of its possible command sequences, speaking as quietly as she could and starting with the most basic elements. 
After discovering how the device stored numbers and phonetics, she watched for unusual responses. Then she hit the jackpot. After replaying the enemy broadcast, she recognized the device had two response flags to the sound it had heard. One was a longer series of values which was very similar to the one the device used for her own identifier. The other flag was shorter and didn't match anything else she had seen so far. She reversed its values and began feeding discrete values into the device until she was able to duplicate the pattern. Once she did, the yellow lights all switched to green and the indicators did as well. Command mode? She whispered to herself. She tried a number of plausible-sounding commands. Status? Location? Report? List? List caused all but one of the indicators to go out, and the one that remained turned yellow. Commands, Zoni said. In her own voice, she heard the device begin to list commands. Position, energy, contacts, coordinates, stored. Hmm, position and coordinates, why both? She said quietly. The device answered in Zoni's voice. Position is user, coordinates is destination. Everything that had happened for the past two weeks flooded back all at once, but this time Zoni had a different perspective. The intrusion into Argent's engineering section. The sudden appearances and disappearances of ships and people, especially Colonel Atwell. They all along knew their enemy was using some kind of teleportation device. Now they had one of their own. And if Zoni's suspicion was right, this little device had stored every piece of data the Argent signals officer needed to effect a rescue plan of her own. She held the device up and spoke a little louder. DSS Argent Engineering. And then she vanished. Chapter 61 Nightwing 1 raced for the safety of DSS Fury's flight deck. Although the massive strike cruiser was many thousands of miles out of position by now, getting the Perseus fleet's second-largest weapons platform back in operation was the flag's top priority. And that meant it was up to Commander Honora Doverly and her highly trained crew of search and rescue specialists. We are clear to navigate, ma'am. Very well, steer us 15 degrees port off Fury approach. Arm two cardinal probes and stand by to engage quick quiet. Affirmative. Cardinals are standing by. Course is now 345 relative fury approach. Speed 1500 FPS. War raged all around the Nightwing's flight path. The frigates Ajax and Minstrel and the destroyer Constellation were pouring beam weapons fire at the remnants of the Agamemnon task force. In the distance, more than a million miles from their position, a huge inbound fleet loomed. Their presence was a dramatic reminder of the price Argent's relatively small battle line would pay if Nightwing 1 failed in its mission to get the Hunter family's ships back in operation in time. All stop. Activate signal suppression protocols. Quick quiet. The pilot responded with the silent activation of the necessary consoles and controls. Nightwing 1 slowed and then stopped in space. Launch Cardinal 1. Doverly said as quietly as possible without making it impossible for her tactical officer to hear. The small black probe rocketed forward from the search and rescue ship's location, instantly assuming Nightwing 1's electronic identity, speed, and course. For all intents and purposes, it was Doverly's SAR vessel, and it was on a course close enough to Fury's approach that it would likely confuse distant enemies long enough for the real ship to get where it needed to go. Bring us about, pilot. Maintain ecliptic approach. Course setting 015 relative fury approach, all ahead one third. Again, the pilot responded without a sound. Nightwing 1 banked in space, turning 15 degrees starboard off Fury's approach. The sleek corvette rocketed forward, approaching the drifting strike cruiser on an oblique course. Secure from quick quiet, Doverly said calmly. Range to Fury now 900 miles and closing fast, the pilot reported. All stop. SSP. Quick quiet. Again, the black SAR vessel stopped in space. Launch Cardinal 2. Another probe silently surged forward, going live with Nightwing 1's signature the moment it was launched. Hold your position, pilot, stand by, Doverly said, watching the plot intently and counting down in her mind to the optimal moment for the search and rescue team to make their move. Hold your position. The vessel waited, suspended in space, ready for anything. Hold. The pilot flexed his fingers around the maneuvering controls. He knew it was going to be close no matter how good they were at their attempts to deceive any observant enemy ships. Course zero by zero, all ahead full, Doverly snapped. The pilot punched the controls and Nightwing 1 sprinted towards the Fury's aft section like it had been fired out of one of Argent's railguns. Their destination rapidly grew in size on the screen. Sound collision, Honora ordered calmly. 
Yellow indicator banks burned from all around the apprehensive crew. Everyone on the bridge fastened their shock harnesses. Give me a roll 31 degree starboard. Signals, get me Fury's ILS frequency and do it quickly. As the suddenly enormous shape of DSS Fury filled the screen, the entire universe rotated in response to Nightwing 1's starboard roll. The cruiser's flight bay was visible, but secured. Negative ILS beacon, ma'am, the signals officer replied. Then we'll have to do this the hard way. Pilot, drop your thrusters at 10,000 yards and put me right next to Fury's ventral soft lock. Schematics are at your station. Aye, ma'am. Stand by for counter thrusters in five, four, three. A few moments later, Nightwing 1 made contact at Fury's aft soft lock. Mechanical systems spun the latches secure. Moments after that, the Corvette was securely bolted to the side of the drifting strike cruiser like a rescue submersible latched to a submarine. Secure from collision, Honora said as she picked up the manual MC transmitter. Medical team to soft lock. Prepare to board the Fury. Set your weapons on stun. Probes first. Look bots second. If you find anyone who needs to be rescued, send an angel third. I want you to stay back. Is that clear, Lieutenant? As a bell, ma'am, came the reply from sickbay. Very well. Activate your cameras when you hit the deck. Bridge out. Hey. Lieutenant Owen set the Nightwing's airlock pressure system to clear the bubble and repressurize the access corridor between the smaller ship and the Fury's egress deck. Ten seconds. Chapter 62 Engineer Yili Curtis was well on her way to solving Argent's power and artificial gravity problem on her own when the whole room seemed to collapse into a loud metal heap at once. One moment it was pitch black and Yili was working by memory and touch, and the next everything was fully lit, and the two Argent officers were on the floor amidst the scattered remains of relay access five and several dozen parts of the power monitoring mechanism. Zoni sat up and brushed herself off dramatically. Hi. How do you have power? Yili asked. The whole ship is dark. I'll tell you all about my magic spells later. I have one charge left in this thing, but the only other place on this ship we can teleport is to the brig. I figured out how to get it to provide a room-sized gravity field just a second ago. Took me two tries to find you. Jumping into the brig isn't very useful, Yili replied, getting back to her feet and helping Zoni up. I wish you could restore power. We've got a big fleet full of big ships out there, and the last I heard they were headed our way. The only other places this thing can go that I recognize are Barker's Asteroid and the Dunkirk. How about the bridge? Zoni shook her head. My working theory is we can only go where it's been before unless we come up with the proper coordinates. Without exact data, we would likely rematerialize in an unfortunate place. Well, we don't want to do that, do we? Yili said, casting about for her field analysis scanner. Can that thing maintain light for us for ten minutes before we go? I think so, Zoni said. What do you have in mind? I think the skipper would appreciate it if we restored power before we fly off to some other planet. There it is. Yili picked up the small device and opened the access panel next to the door. The manual system disengaged the track locks and the door slid to one side easily. I've got a working theory. Yili said as she dropped the battery out of the sensor unit and rammed a new one into the slot in its place. The device lit up and booted. Our enemies are using a power transfer scrambling technology of some kind. It works very effectively against our ships because I think whoever is using it knows our ships rather well. Zoni followed Yili into the auxiliary power control room for Reactor 3. The scrambler is a fleet technology? Yep. How do you know? Because I invented it. Hold this. Yili handed the sensor to Zoni. She put on a pair of thickly insulated black gloves and opened a large metal door. She clamped both hands around a set of thick black wires and began tugging at them. She planted one foot on the wall and tugged harder until they ripped loose. Pieces of plastic and metal skittered and bounced along the floor. Yili dropped the wires, removed one glove and reached into the circuitry, gazing at the ceiling and obviously looking by touch for something. She found it and pulled it loose. Gimme. Zoni handed the sensor back to Yili. The engineer pondered the little device she had removed from deep inside Argent's mechanism while she analyzed it with the sensor unit. The good news is it doesn't affect our batteries, so all we have to do is warm up the level 3 backups. These relays aren't damaged at all. Yili handed the sensor back to Zoni and replaced the relay. Ever see an engineer jumpstart a strike battleship with a standard shop battery pack? Nope, but there's a first time for everything, Zoni said with a jaunty grin.
Yili reached behind a metal frame on the opposite side of the room and retrieved a smooth white device with rounded corners and edges about the size of a large gas can. She placed the device next to the relay console along the opposite wall and picked up two of the black wires she had yanked out of the access panel. In a few moments, the relay console had booted. Dominique, this is Senior Lieutenant Yili Curtis, Chief Engineering Officer of DSS Argent, Identifier Ghost 2946. Match voice print and acknowledge. Affirmative, Yili. How can Argent help you today? Zoni's face lit up with a delighted smile. How did you do that? Yili smiled. Dominique, I need to do a three-step cold start of Argent's life support subsystems using only level three power sources. Advise on a 30-second delay and prepare to transfer power to intraship communications and activate the MC. Acknowledge. Acknowledged, engineer. Standing by to activate life support at your command. Perform cold restart in sequence and transmit safety warnings at 60-second intervals until further instructed. Curtis out. Yili closed the cover on the relay console. Argent will be back to full operation in about four minutes. I coded a message for the skipper in case any of our other ships are affected. Did you say that thing can take us to Barker's asteroid? Yili was busy slapping new charger packs into her blaster pistols. She powered up a spare for Zoni. It got me here. I'm not sure how, but I think it can put us on that rock the same way. Yili handed the signals officer a portable comm unit and a blaster. The intraship MC sounded an alert tone followed by Dominique's pleasant voice. Attention all personnel. Attention all personnel. Engineering has initiated a cold restart of all activated Level 3 power systems. Emergency gravity protocols are in effect. Stand by for reactivation of life support. All personnel secure by physical handholds. Repeat. All personnel secure by physical handholds. Stand by 30 seconds. Mark. Take us to the big gun, Lieutenant, Yili said. Gladly. Zoni activated the unit and both officers vanished again. Chapter 63 Echo shut down all of her running lights and moved forward towards Fury's deck one access corridor. There were blast marks on the bulkheads and a small fire was still burning inside one of the circuit relay access bays on the far side of the opening. There was enough light in the corridor to see beyond the hatch. Alert indicators were blinking various shades of red and yellow all along the far bulkhead. The small vehicle pulled forward just far enough to train her visual pickups on the hatch. From the bridge, it would have looked like a small ambulance was peeking around the bulkhead edge. There were several bodies on the deck. The hatch itself was torn and scorched and hanging from a single hinge. There was just enough room for Echo's chassis to get through to the bridge. Echo did a microsecond sensor sweep of all visible space between her position and the forward bulkhead of Fury's bridge. She detected life signs, but no movement. All of the electronic wavelengths were dark except for the ever-present jamming energy that was being broadcast from outside of Fury's hull. She still could not detect any of her Minibot companion's transponders. Nevertheless, there were life signs on the bridge, and that meant someone might need help. Echo knew AC was here somewhere. She pulled forward carefully, turning to avoid the splayed limbs of the bodies in the corridor. She kept her lights off, maneuvering by visuals alone. Finally, she reached the hatch and did a full sweep of the bridge. Two life signs. Echo rolled onto the bridge of DSS Fury. AC had reminded her time and time again that although she was authorized to communicate with the other ships in the Perseus fleet, and although she could alert the other officers in Commander Hunter's task force to danger, she and the other bots must never, never enter the bridge without special permission from AC herself. This was ostensibly to prevent a possible safety incident where bridge personnel could potentially stumble over the minibots. Ultimately, however, the regulations were rather specific with regard to bridge personnel. Anyone aboard would need permission from Jace to be on the bridge in the first place. Hunter just formalized the instructions as far as the minibots were concerned. There was only one directive in Echo's command table that could override the restrictions on entering the bridge. If something is wrong, go to AC. As Echo pulled up alongside her creator, she realized just how wrong things actually were. The little trauma unit went straight to work. Her medical sensor sleeve extended and wrapped around Hunter's arm and her little probes extended to positions in front of and beside Jace's head. The consoles on her dorsal section rotated to display her patient's vital signs. Inside Echo's chassis, powerful chemical synthesis facilities began analyzing Jace's blood. Sophisticated circuitry started to diagnose her patient's condition. 
new plasma and blood were synthesized and added to Jace's intravenous circulation. Filtering systems kicked in. Small doses of epinephrine, pain medication, folic acid, and thiamine were added at regular intervals. Echo didn't detect any internal injuries, so she elected not to add clotting agents. Jace's pulse strengthened. Her respiration followed. Echo waited patiently. She performed another microsecond sweep of the nearby area. No movement. No sound. She knew Fury was tumbling and adrift, but even though many of the ship's power systems were down, life support seemed to be functional, if erratic. Commander Hunter's eyes fluttered open. Hi. Jace moved a little, her eyes finally focused. Echo. Her voice sounded hoarse. I think you got a concussion. You should stay for a minute. How did you get all the way up here? Jace coughed and tried to move her arm. She stopped when she noticed the pressure sleeve. Your battery level is down to 11%. What happened? I told the nurse I would get help because all we had in sickbay was a little generator and my batteries didn't have enough power for all the intensive care machines. I tried to keep them all going, but I couldn't. You drained your reserves trying to run all of sickbay on just your own batteries? Uh-huh. It would have worked too, but Fury's power is out, so I couldn't get any more and I couldn't find the others, so I had to find you instead. Do you know where I can get more power to make the intensive care work again? AC smiled. You don't have to run all of sickbay by yourself, Echo. The ship will help you. Because it has bigger batteries, huh? Yeah. Am I well enough to sit up yet? I think so, but we gotta find a doctor for the concussion. We'll do that next. Can you help Lieutenant Mallory for me? Okay. Echo retrieved all of her treatment sensors and backed up a few feet so AC could sit up. She rolled around the commander's feet and started treating Lieutenant Mallory, following the same steps as before. Jace felt a wave of dizziness as she got to her feet. She used the tactical console for support and tried to access the ship's command computer. All the consoles remained dark. She keyed her personal comlink. It activated, but dimly. Hunter to engineering. Static. Then a faint signal. Jace keyed the filter controls. Bridge. Hunter. Identify yourself. Commander, this is Lieutenant Walter Owens, DSS Argent Search and Rescue. We are on Deck 18, starboard side aft. What is your condition? Good to hear your voice, Lieutenant. I have the con. We have several casualties here, but that isn't our top priority. There are hostiles aboard. I need a damage control party to engineering to restore battery power so we can recover maneuvering control. Can you assist us? Affirmative, Commander. We have two of Argent's engineering crew aboard. Coordinate with Nightwing 1 on emergency channel C5. Stand by. Skipper? Hunter knelt by her CIC officer. Sabrina, how do you feel? Like I fell out of bed, about two stories. What's our status? Mallory coughed. Jace looked over at Echo. She was completely dark and not moving. Mallory sat up. Echo? No response. Hunter put her hand on the little ambulance inside. She did it again. Ran herself completely dark trying to save my crew. I'll never understand this little creature I made. But you built her, didn't you? Isn't that part of her design? I built her to stop and go to minimal operation at 5% battery charge. She can keep running for hours in that state on 5% power. I built that into her programming so she wouldn't leave herself completely defenseless like this. But she does it anyway. Hunter nodded. She's been doing this since I got my command. I've run thousands of tests and I'll never understand how she does it. She just won't let anything stand between her and her duty, even her own programming. Chapter 64 Raise the Spruins The third watch signals officer raced to open the hailing channel. Does the con have maneuvering control? Aye, sir. Pilot has positive control. Bring us about heading 320. Get me engineering. The look on Jason Hunter's face told the story. His ship was nearly crippled and had just barely started to recover. I have Commander Teller aboard the Spruance, sir. Francis, I want Spruance, Exeter, and Revenge to take point until Argent is fully operational. Acknowledge. Acknowledged, Argent. Spruance has the ball. The two escort cruisers shifted their positions in the Perseus formation forward of their capital ship. There was very nearly an audible sigh of relief on the Argent Bridge as the two powerful vessels brightly glowing side-by-side -side drive sections hovered into view. Engineering, Madison. Olivia, where is Yeely? Hunter barked. Unknown, sir. We've had some failures in our auxiliary couplers. 
My guess is she's on deck 31 with damage control. How long to restore the mains? Auxiliary power is online. I'll have reactors 1 and 4 up in a minute. Very well. Divert all power to forward battle screens until further instructed. Bridge out. Exeter came into view from below Argent's position. The three heaviest ships in the formation were now on the point. The remaining five escort vessels took close-in supporting positions to defend against the oncoming threat. Sir, I have a message from Lieutenant Curtis. It's pre-recorded, sir. Hunter grabbed a headset and listened intently. He whispered to himself as the substance of his engineer's message became clear. What the hell? The tactical officer waited patiently for orders. Raise Skywatch. I want our fighter cover to break off pursuit of the Agamemnon fleet and return to their patrol stations. Raise Nightwing 1 on priority channel. Aye, sir. Coding your message. CIC, Briggs. Nathan, give me the bad news and do it quickly. Very well, sir. We have two battle groups bracketing our formation. The first is headed up by the heavy battleship Kingsblade. The other is anchored by the fleet carrier Orca. Both groups have multiple capital escorts in the 300, 000 ton range. They are all armed with long-range Lancer-class missiles. The Orca has ten squadrons of two-gen jacks with echelon ship-killer weapons. Silence reigned on the bridge. Tactical. The forward screen switched to display the relative positions of Hunter's group and the two approaching battle lines. The red indicator icons moved gradually closer to the center, where Argent and her clustered squadrons waited. Ten thousand people are going to die in the next two hours if we don't find a way to put a stop to this. Hunter said quietly. Sir, I have Commander Doverly on priority channel. Honora, please let it be good news. Sounds like you're losing your nerve over there, Captain. Hunter sat up in his chair. Jace? What? You don't recognize my voice? Fury is awaiting orders. I hope you're ready for the biggest fight of our lives, Commander. We've got six heavies inbound along with a dozen escorts and over a hundred fighters. How are my archers and cavalry doing? Jason smiled despite himself. They're drunk and asleep. Well, that's what you get for hiring Irish mercenaries, Captain. The way I see it, we need to give our friends time to do their work. What do you say we make it a race? Risky. With all due respect, less risky than flying between those formations, sir. I'll grant you that. What do you propose? Let's take our group around the horn. Permission to keep Honora on our side of the fence for now— I trust you can coordinate CSP with a substitute. We'll secure Nightwing 1 in Fury's landing bay. Permission granted. Hunter out. Jason swiveled his chair back to face forward. All right, pilot. Let's coordinate navigation with Spruance and follow my sister's suggestion. Bring the formation about. Course 124, Mark 335. All excess power to aft battle screens. Prepare to engage the mains. Aye, sir. Helm answering. New course on the board and locked in. Escorts acknowledging. Signals put me on the inner ship. Let's hope this works. Chapter 65 Lieutenants Curtis and Tixia rematerialized at an altitude of six feet. Yeely saw someone go for their weapon. She managed a crude shoulder roll and came up shooting. Blinding white flashes crossed in the small room. The guard cried out and landed hard. His weapon clattered across the floor next to the overturned chair. Footsteps thumped outside. Curtis scrambled to her feet and motioned for Zoni to move back. Another guard appeared in the door. The impact of Yili's twin blasts threw him back against the hatch edge. He landed face first and didn't move again. The scent of burnt composite cloth and polyester drifted through the room. Zoni examined the bioelectric unit. Now all the lights were out. She spoke quietly into what she thought was the audio pickup. Nothing happened. It's dead. Hope we can find a way off this rock because we used our last free pass. Or maybe we can find another one of those things, Yili said as she turned the two men over and relieved the second guard of his power packs. These two jokers are fleet. Looks like we've kicked off a civil war. Oh, wow, Zoni said. Would you take a look at that? Outside the viewport, the sweeping shape of the Sentinel planetary defense weapon rose like an ancient monument above the rocky formations surrounding it. Brand new. Yili said. Someone went to a whole lot of trouble to build one of those. That barrel is 700 feet. They must have been planning whatever is going on here for a year or more. Good thing it isn't powered, Zoni replied. Yili went back to checking her weapons. 
The more we talk about this, the less and less sense it makes to me, Lieutenant. She handed Zoni a second blaster pistol and the holster to go with it. Why build a big gun and make it the centerpiece of your whole strategy, then fail to build a power system for it? That's been bugging me, too. There's got to be power down here somewhere. I'm just not buying that we sent enough for one shot stuff. Either they took their shot and blew out their relays or there's more going on here than we know about. Maybe some of their numbers got cold feet at the last minute. Or they suddenly realized they had fired on a Skywatch strike battleship and didn't want to be on the losing side when Argent shoots back. Maybe there's a weakness here we don't know about. Let's go find it, Yili said, peering out into the corridor. Affirmative, engineer, you're in charge. Zoni drew her weapon and prepared to move out of the small guard post. Say again, we're the same rank. Order of precedence, engineering outranks signals. Oh, well, I never got that far in the regulations. If this thing has a power system, that portable sensor unit will tell us where it is. Let's go find it and see if we can grant the skipper his wish. What's that? We're going to commandeer this gun and hit that enemy formation so hard they'll be pulled over for speeding back at Core 2. Chapter 66 Lieutenant Colonel Lucas Moody was confused and getting angrier by the moment. After Atwell had dismissed himself and left his ostensible prisoner standing at the edge of what appeared to be a vertigo-inducing cavern containing Admiral Hughes's prison, the Marine officer had done a little exploring of his own. There were walkways and side corridors, all made of the same chitinous material he and Captain Hunter had encountered when they first boarded the Dunkirk. An immense tunnel extended into darkness. Around it, a dozen or more smaller side passages broke off and twisted away. The whole complex seemed to be made of the same material that huge insects' armored back was made of. But there was something else, too. It was a presence Moo couldn't put into words, but he still knew it was there. It was almost as if he were experiencing a sixth sense. A sense of the unknown just at the edge of his experience, but discernible enough he could reach a little further and put a shape and a color and a size to it. Everywhere he went and in every direction he looked, he could feel the sinister presence of living malice. There was an overwhelming dread just around the next corner. It was dark and wet. Then there was the seethe. At regular intervals, as if it were the heartbeat of a sleeping titan, the entire complex seemed to experience some kind of spasm. Moo could feel it and hear it. If he concentrated, he could even register a change in temperature. The air would shrink and become hotter and closer, and then everything would relax at once, and the world would return to its dank, sopping former reality. But there was something else. The colonel couldn't quite put his finger on it, but there was a sensation all around him that he couldn't quite shake. The visuals outside of the huge tunnel were awe-inspiring and more than a little unsettling, to be sure. It looked as if he were staring into a chamber that held a miniaturized planet with all the size and depth such a concept would bring to the mind of a reasonable person. The problem was just that. It all seemed to be perception. Mu couldn't deny what he saw, but what is a man to do when one sense is telling him something and the other four are shouting in opposition? The sense of being in a much smaller place was all around him as he navigated the strangely colored tunnel. Even though he had to stoop and run a hand along the ceiling as he made his way, there was more to his sense than simply formerly being in a big place and now being in a small place. He was reminded of his subterranean exploration training, when his team was required to survey underground locations for potential combat threats. He had never been particularly claustrophobic, but he had men, including officers, in his command who were. The effects of being afraid to climb into confined spaces were always surprising to him, as he had never experienced that kind of white-faced panic before. This place he was in felt for all the world like being underground somehow. The colonel was well aware there was no engineering or science known to man that would allow a planet-sized chamber to be constructed underground. A heavy surface that large could not be suspended that far from its counterpart without earthworks beyond the imagination of the most fanciful architect or magic beyond the whims of a spinner of fantastical fairy tales. Even if there were some kind of artificial gravity in operation, the shape of the chamber was simply not physically capable of maintaining its shape at such magnified dimensions. Colonel Moody didn't have any immediate theories, and ultimately all of this would end up being well-evaluated by men and women far better educated and well-equipped than a commanding officer of Marine ground forces. One thing Moo did know was Marines live by basics. You put on your boots and you walk into combat, 
and if that means you have to overcome the enemy by improvising a weapon and adapting to conditions that others can't, so be it. It didn't change the rules. Marines live by basics from Commandant to Buck Private, and in this situation the basics were becoming clearer and clearer to one Lieutenant Colonel Moody. Hughes was either insane or being held hostage. Either possibility demanded a response by Argent's crew. Moody knew Jason Hunter's mission was to take Hughes into custody on charges of dereliction of duty, and Moo was sworn to carry out his captain's orders. However, if the Admiral were being held hostage, as Colonel Atwell had implied, then a rescue was called for. Either way, Moo had to find a way to get to the Admiral and ascertain once and for all where he stood in all this. If what the captain had heard aboard the alternate universe Dunkirk was true, Hughes would seem to have implicated himself in a plot to overthrow human governance and potentially attack his own kind. Moo was willing to believe that up to a point, but he also knew Charles Hughes was a decorated Skywatch officer with nearly 30 years of service. He was a former frigate skipper who had won numerous engagements as part of the squadron that gave Argent's planetside command group both its seal and its name. His record and achievements vaulted him to the Admiralty at a time when it was nearly impossible for a line officer to be spared. He was not a man likely to defect. He certainly wasn't a man likely to commit an act of wanton treason under enemy fire. No, there was something else going on here, and Moo was beginning to wonder if the strange sensations he was experiencing might have something to do with it. Atwell had made it all very clear. The human fleets were meant to kill each other and leave the nearby civilian worlds undefended. The Ithis were ready to empty Hughes's mind to make that happen. But Atwell said something else that stuck with the colonel. He made a direct threat against Moo's captain. He said they were going to make mankind extinct, and that they were going to start with Jason Hunter. Why? Chapter 67. What's so urgent? That will be all, Sergeant. Captain Hunter held the door while the Marine Strike Sergeant excused himself, then closed it. He gestured for his sister to take a seat at the conference table, then seated himself in the same chair he occupied during the briefing. He was in his trademark high-energy mode, and his sister braced herself. These conversations went quick and covered a lot of ground. Status of Fury? Operational with main power. I left Honora in command. That quick, eh? She's the senior officer aboard. My XO is a good man. They'll be fine if there's trouble. What is going on around here? This has to be kept between you and me, Commander. Jason never addressed his sister as Commander seriously unless there was something dreadfully sober going on. I just got a love letter from my engineer. Apparently she and my signals officer are playing hooky on Barker's asteroid. Jay sat in stunned silence for a moment. My sister is speechless. Wow, I'm going to have to write to Mom. Are you sure you're well? Wait. What have you done with Jace Hunter? How? Apparently, Zoni snagged one of the alien communication devices off a downed intruder. Their working theory is those devices are Ithis technology adapted for their human collaborators. They are bioengineered to draw their energy from their user. The one Yili and Zoni are using was running out of energy, but they thought they could use the last of it to zap themselves into the control station out there. Now I know why it was so easy to convince you to take a trip around the edge of that asteroid field. You're betting they'll get that gun operational by the time we have to turn back. Jason stood and referenced the display of Gitarn space. There are two possibilities. Either King 2 is going to match us waypoint for waypoint and try to wear us down with fighter engagements if we take the long way around. Or, Jace continued, they'll cut across the asteroid field and make it a botched, stolen base maneuver. Jason pointed and performed a little victory gesture. Exactly. Now I've been working on the assumption that one way or another I was going to get Lieutenant Tixia up close and personal with that minefield eventually. If we give her enough time, she's going to have that whole array reprogrammed to fight for our side. And if we can somehow encourage King 2 to try and cut us off, they'll fly right through the asteroid field thinking those mines are still programmed to stand down when they get their transponder signals. The biggest traffic pileup in fleet history, Jace mused. If we do this right... Zoni will have reconfigured them to open fire on all transponders that don't match the Perseus strike group, and if we do it on time, we could cut their strength by half. And with the Sentinel there to pick off the big boys, we could mission kill the entire formation in one pass. A fine strategy, Captain. I'm surprised I didn't think of it first. You did. Say again? 
Archers and cavalry commander were just changing their hats. What about Dunkirk? Jace pointed at the single contact following a hyperbolic course towards the east edge of the minefield. She's due to hit the edge of the asteroids in about 15 minutes. That's going to be our safety in this formation. If Yili and Zoni fail, Commander Demay can fly through those mines even if they aren't reconfigured. And if they are? Won't Dunkirk set them off? She will if Zoni forgets she's out there. Let's hope everybody gets everything right and in the right order then, Jace said as she got to her feet. I don't need to remind you about the first rule of combat, sir. Which is? The first bullet fired blows every battle plan all to hell. Chapter 68 Bridge, report! Enemy contacts closing range, sir. If they get a clear shot at our engines, we're done for, Lieutenant Austin replied. A bone-jarring impact wave pounded against the Dunkirk's aft section. Maintain evasive action. Stand by to attenuate our drive field, Commander DeMay shouted. Weapons bay out. With the ship screaming in protest against the drive field absent acceleration and every piece of metal in the relatively cramped weapons bay rattling as if under a freight trestle, Toby DeMay worked quickly. The internals of the particular model of ship killer missile he and the two other technicians were reprogramming were complicated, but thankfully easy to reach without specialized tools. They would have been considerably easier to modify if the work didn't have to be done during the spaceflight equivalent of a typhoon. But Skywatch combat officers rarely got to pick the starting conditions for a fight. Another explosion lifted the deck a good 15 feet. Then it fell away. Everything crashed to the floor again. Tools flew in all directions. Pieces of molded composite broke into pieces and scattered all over the room. Commander DeMay tried to regain his feet, but the dizziness and the painful impact of his shoulder and elbow against the rigid metal floor almost cost him his consciousness. It was a good thing the missiles they were working on were impact-shielded. Otherwise, the Dunkirk would be nothing more than a fast-moving debris field by now. Finally, the skipper managed to climb back to a position from which he could see inside the missile he was modifying. The display had switched over to indicate proximity arming. These were the kinds of modifications that would normally be made automatically from the bridge or manually from tactical control. But without sufficient crew, the Dunkirk's skeleton crew had to do things the hard way. Missile 2 configured, he shouted over the din. The other technician gave the thumbs-up sign and began to seal the access panel on his missile with his handheld power-bolting unit. DeMay finished his final preparations and signaled the bridge once more. Bridge, Austin! All right, Lieutenant, we've got three weapons standing by. Prepare to activate ventral airlock 3 and shut down all ECM channels on my order. Affirmative. Signals console is standing by. Range to enemy spacecraft. Tactical reports range now 140,000 miles and closing on an oblique pursuit. Range to asteroid field? And we will hit the leading edge in 46 seconds, sir. Very well, Bridge. Stand by to launch proximity weapons. DeMay gave the signal, and all three men trundled the first of the relatively light ship killers into the lift mechanism. They locked the wheels of the transport into the lift's floor mounts and cleared the platform. One of the technicians manned the airlock controls and waited for the deploy order. Commander DeMay watched carefully as the lead ship in the pursuit formation moved into position to target the Dunkirk's engines. Activate airlock! The lift mechanism rotated on its long axis, turning the missile and its transport over and downward facing. It lowered itself into the outer access bay. Fast-moving mechanical doors sealed the airlock chamber. Red lights blinked in sequence along the two doors' edges, indicating both a mechanical and a magnetic lock. Hull systems report a total integrity seal, sir. Standing by. Range to target, bridge. 120 kiloclicks, optimum range. Jettison 1. At the technician punched the release controls for ventral airlock 3. The transport clamps blasted free and pieces of their mechanism tumbled into space just before the missile followed. The white cylindrical weapon casing began to tumble away from the fast-moving strike cruiser. Its internal systems went active, measuring range and relative speed with all other contacts. It locked on the lead pursuer and began broadcasting old-style radar signals in all directions. Weapon at half range in five, four, three. DeMay waited patiently until Lieutenant Austin reported the missile had reached the halfway point between the two ships before turning the two keys on his console. Sequences one and two active. Affirmative, sir. Arming the weapon. Sequence three active. We have a magnetic lock on the lead ship. 
the fast destroyer's proximity alarm sounded, but the closure speed between it and the practically impossible to detect missile the Dunkirk had dropped in the road for it to run over was way too fast for any kind of evasive maneuvers. Its forward screens flared to life angrily an instant before a white-hot burst of gravitic, magnetic, and thermal energy thumped into existence and then trailed behind. The ship staggered on its course as nearly all of its defensive systems overloaded themselves trying to absorb the 15-megaton explosion their ship had just punctured. Its escort fired its heaviest beam weapons indiscriminately at the Dunkirk's aft section. Each shot lit up space in all directions, but none of the weapons were able to make contact. With her drive field down, the Dunkirk had a considerably smaller EM profile, which made things very hard on enemy battle computers. Picking out something as relatively small as a spacecraft in a quarter-million-mile diameter sphere was a challenge under the best of conditions. Small chunks of rock began to streak past the destroyers. Bridge, keep that plot continuously updated. Report. DeMay was busy helping the technician move Missile 2 into the airlock. Barker's asteroid now at 800,000 miles and closing, sir. We have a proximity mine at point six. Maintain operational transponder signals. Stand by to launch a second weapon. DeMay knew if he didn't get his ship's drive field reestablished, the whole trip could end rather abruptly with an asteroid impact. They had to launch their second weapon. The destroyer escorts began to dodge and spiral through a roller coaster like course. Their battle screens smashed into the smaller debris while their pilots and navigators tried to avoid the larger objects. One mistake would pulverize their ship, even with its screens up and at full power. Missile 2 away. The commander returned to his console and monitored the second missile's location. He had made certain the warhead wouldn't respond to any spectrometric signature other than a vessel hull. They only needed a few more seconds. A close detonation shook the weapons bay, but the captain held on to his console and didn't take his eyes off the plot. Now, arm weapon! This time the missile caught the escort ship's location after it performed a desperate swerve to avoid an oncoming 500-foot slab of ferrous iron and smooth rock. The missile changed course and hurtled towards the vessel's port side. Its pilot performed a flawless starboard evasive maneuver, but was too close to the other destroyer to avoid its drive field. The two magnetic spheres briefly crackled against each other, draining away most of their power for just an instant. Then the warhead detonated. Destroyer 2 rolled out of control directly into the path of Destroyer 1. Hulls clipped each other at nearly 4,000 miles per second. The resulting spins nearly instantly tore the vessels to pieces. When their fusion bottles ruptured and reacted with what remained of their unstable drive fields, a super-hot energy burst appeared momentarily, then faded. The metal remains of the two ships tumbled away into space and became permanent features of the asteroid field. We got him, sir, Austin shouted. The sparse crew of the Dunkirk cheered over the intraship.